Hello, and welcome back to the lab. Today on the bench, we have something that is an incredibly rare occurrence in the lab. We have a reshoot video. Um, so I know what's going to happen, and I want to talk about that. Uh, I got a look at this particular video, and I was not happy with the way it turned out at all. So I am going to reshoot this video, and we're going to get something better posted for everybody. I don't do a lot of reshoot videos because I've spoken with patrons who have been with me from the beginning, and it was requested of me to show the successes and the failures. So even if a video is a little bit rough, um, I'm putting it out there because not everything goes perfect in the lab. Actually, does it very rarely go perfect in the lab? So lots of challenges, and um, that's part of overcoming the situation at hand and affecting a repair. In this case, we're talking about the Leo Bodnar, I hope I'm saying that right, dual port GPS DO, which is this guy right here. So as we can see, Leo Bodnar Electronics, and we have a GPS reference clock, 400 hertz to 810 megahertz. Now that's pretty critical piece of information when looking at the results of this video because of some of the equipment we have here in the lab. We're doing an analysis on GPS stabilized clocks and especially 10 megahertz references. This is not a 10 megahertz reference. This is a GPS locked variable Frequency generator, I guess, is how I'd classify this. I'm not 100% sure. It's not a function generator or anything like that. But you do have some control over the output. There's a... If I'm remembering the software correctly, there's a drive section where you tell the output what drive current to use, and that will put out a waveform. And it is adjustable a little bit. It's not tunable like a function generator or a signal source or something like that where you can step it by indi individual microvolts. It is a, I think it's like two, five, eight milliamps into the drive, uh, into the amplifier. Where this sits in the lab is up that way. We'll zoom in up there. And uh, it does hook to my external GPS antenna. Actually, all the GPS stuff I have a GPS splitter that's in the line, and so one of the devices feeds the external antenna power, and it feeds all three GPS devices here in the lab. This particular clock, my Stratum 1 time server that is available um, to access externally, is something that I was able to post to the web for patrons of the channel. They can hit that and get some uh, get some private Stratum 1 time service, uh, NTP services. The other one is my main GPS clock that drives my rubidium standard, which is the fundamental frequency base for the lab. So for those who are just tuning in, finding this video for the first time, to get the frequency stability to do this analysis, we have the antenna comes in, goes into a splitter, which feeds three devices, so there's no skew there. It's just the same signal to three devices. It then goes into a one pulse per second, or it goes into a GPS DO, which is a 10 megahertz reference, but it also outputs one PPS, which is one pulse per second. That one pulse per second goes into my Stanford Research FS725, which is a rubidium 10 megahertz reference. So we have the stabilization chain that happens is the GPS signal disciplines the rubidium for long-term stability, but the rubidium disciplines the output for short-term stability. So short-term stability on these GPS DOs, they wander a little bit. It's not a lot, but it is a little bit. You get, I believe it's two or three decimal places more accuracy on a rubidium standard, and that's a about where the cost benefit ratio kind of falls off. Um, to get the extra digit of accuracy past rubidium, you have to go to cesium, you have to go to maser, 
uh, and the cost kind of goes nuts from there. Uh, cesium is about $50,000 for the box. I have seen a hydrogen maser available for purchase. It was 1.5... No, no, sorry. It was $150,000 for the hydrogen maser. That is out of the budget for the lab by far. I there, There's no way I can do that. Um, so we're at Rubidium. So we have GPS comes in. And usually I see about 15 satellites where I'm at. So we get a really stable GPS signal. Goes into the GPSDO. The GPSDO does one pulse per second into the Stanford. And the Stanford takes over and does short-term um, stability for the measurements in the lab. Testing methodology on this is all this testing is done with a Keithley... 53230A. This is the best frequency counter we have in the lab, and this is my what I've been using for the testing. Reason being is it's got a narrow enough capture window at 20 picoseconds that it can it can catch some of these where the thing wanders. Prior to this, my frequency counter, pardon the movement, was right here. A venerable 53131A. Not, uh, great frequency counter. I actually still use it in the lab. But it it won't pick up exactly what I need to do this really fine ADEV analysis or Allen variance on these GPSDOs because we are way down in the noise, which is not necessarily a problem. Everything's nice and stable and not moving very much. Before we get into the software on this guy, one thing to note in this video, especially when we look at the results, is this is a variable clock. I can pick anything from 400 to 810 megahertz. So now you can't, uh, one of the drawbacks on this is output one is variable, but output two has to be tied to output one. So you can't just arbitrarily set this to 400 and this to 800 megahertz. There, there is some limitations with the two outputs, but you do have the entire span available for output one. Output two needs to be mathematically related to output one for it to um, for it to come on. I haven't seen that as a limitation. It just is the way it's designed. In comparison, this is a GPSDO. Reference clock, not variable. We have the one pulse per second output, we have 10 megahertz, and we have antenna in. That's it, no control, no nothing. Put GPS in here, get 10 megahertz out here, that's it, that's all it does. One thing to keep in mind as we go through the two. Okay, here's our software, management software for the clock in question. The we can see my serial number, but that's not a huge deal. We can turn on output 1 and output 2. You have to set 8 milliamps, 16 milliamps, 24 or 32 milliamps drive strength. So that's pretty much all we get for amplitude variation on the output. This guy, you don't get any settings on it. It just is what it is. And as a matter of fact, uh, I do need to have an attenuator on the one pulse per second going into the Stanford Research because it was running a little hot for that unit, so I had to knock the signal down a little bit. Uh, my firmware version's up to date and software version's up to date. Um, these checkboxes just turn the output on and off. You can identify the output. It just blinks the light. So output one, you can set it arbitrarily. We can just type in anything from 400 to 108, or 810 and in here. But output two, there'll be a drop down that gives you the options you can set output two to. So these will vary depending on what you set output one to. So I have output one set to 10 megahertz right now because uh, that's what I was testing it on. And so that's why we're at, we have these as options. We do not have a signal loss count. If there was an error, because I can hit update, you'll actually see no PLL lock down here. 
and then it'll tell us how many times we've lost GPS signal. I had it off to put it in front of the camera, so that's why we haven't had any, any lost signal count. The last time I looked at it, it was like two or three, so it's relatively stable. See satellites all the time. So, testing methodology. The we gave the gear a proper warm up. I would give each GPS DO a minimum of a 24 hour warm up time. The Leo, when I did this testing, had greater than 24 hours. We take a Allen variance with 100 samples and a peak to peak variance with 100 samples. There will be a link to the EEV blog post that has this spreadsheet attached so you can take a look at it. And patrons, when you see this video early for Patreon, uh, I'll upload this Excel document in with the video as well. So you guys will have it just to download. Every measurement's done with 100 samples. And then we have different gate times. So we did it at 100 seconds, 10 seconds, 1 second, 0.1 seconds, and 0 0.01 seconds. GPS DOs, all of them, as the gate time gets shorter, they wobble a little more because they're a long-term clock, not a short-term clock. Or they have long-term stability, not short-term stability. Their short-term stability is still pretty good. Also, the Leo, as we look through the results, is variable where the other two that are on this page are fixed. So at 100 seconds of gate time, the Allen variance was 38 microhertz, where the peak to peak was 236 microhertz. With 10 seconds, we had a Allen variance of 277 microhertz and a peak to peak of 1 millihertz or 1.5 millihertz. So we're still three orders of magnitude off of 1 hertz. So not bad, but not as stable as the fixed clocks. So the fixed clocks get you a little bit more stability. And that's pretty much true across the board. So at one second, we were at 502 microhertz. At And peak-to-peak uh, -peak was 3.6 millihertz. So at one second, it averaged out better than the peak-to-peak. -peak. So it wobbled 3 millihertz, but we got to 500 microhertz because of the averaging. Point 0.1, we were at uh, 551 microhertz and... 2.97 millihertz. Again, the averaging knocked knocked down the Allen variance because it, it, it walks. So it gets a little faster, a little slower, and it just kind of walks around 10, 10 megahertz. That's, that's what they all do. The 0.01, so 10 milliseconds, uh, we had 2.2 millihertz of ADEV, and we had 18 millihertz of wobble. Uh, peak to peak. So one thing that I did not do in the beginning testing that I did do with the Leo, and I will do if people would like me to test more of these GPS DOs, run them through the same testing uh, test parameters, is I forget specifically who asked me in the comments to check holdover, but I was asked to see how they did in holdover as well. So the first data point I got was for the Leo. The way holdover was done is it was unplugged from the GPS antenna, let it uh, fall into holdover, and then we went from the smallest gate time to the largest gate time, and we didn't give it a break. As fast as I could do the measurements, that's how we took them. Now, at 100 samples, at 100 seconds... That's a two and a half hour test. So because we did 100 samples every time, as the gate time increased, the testing time went up exponentially. It actually goes pretty quick. This is only 100 seconds, so not too bad. When you start getting into 10 second gate time, 100 second gate time, the window keeps, um, well, the test just takes longer. So we had a 2.2 point, 2 point 
We did not. Uh, yeah, we did get into microhertz, but we only got into microhertz on the point one seconds of gate time. Everything else is in millihertz. So where we had 500 microhertz of ADEV when it was locked, the accuracy did degrade a little bit in unlock, which is true for everything. I would expect that regardless on which unit it was. Um, I don't have data points for the other two, but I'm sure their accuracy would have degraded a little bit as well, um, not being locked to the GPSDO, or not being locked to the GPS uh, satellites. So, all in all, good unit. Um, not unhappy with the performance, and uh, I do find it every once in a while, it is highly useful in the lab, to have one uh, and I did run it as my primary until I got the oh I, I think it's a Samsung module is what I'm running here in the lab as my primary the um, BG7 TBL I pass that on to another technician um, this TM4313 that's still here um, if anybody needs a GPS clock reach out to the lab um, and we'll see what we can make happen. The runtime on it is a little over 24 hours, at least from when it was here. Um, but it is still in except exceptionally good condition. So, that's it for this one. Because it's a reshoot, the testing was already done. And I did check... Um, I was kind of unsure about these numbers, and I was kind of unsure about the testing methodology that I was running in the lab when doing this evaluation. But I was chatting with some of the uh, members of the Time Nuts mailing list, and I was getting similar numbers to what some of the other users were seeing specifically on the Leo clocks. So pretty sure the numbers are good, um, but even with them being... Well, I had a bit of doubt, but the doubt has gone down with the addition of the addition of some new information. So, if you're curious, check out the Excel sheet that's attached in the description. And if you'd like us to see, and if you'd like to see any other testing performed on camera, requests are always taken. Leave a comment in the comment section below this video, and we will definitely see what we can make happen. Patreons are running five videos ahead at the moment, and uh, their assistance helps keep the light on, help keeps videos coming. So thank you to everyone who is a patron, or a patron and supports the channel. The help goes way more than you guys could possibly imagine. So with that, as always, more is on the way. And I will see everybody in the next video.